why would I be talking about this now, here? If I'm talking about countercult apologetics and trying to establish the rudiments of a New Testament basis for such an animal as countercult apologetics, why would I take so much trouble to bring it to you? Because I'm guessing that for the most part I would be preaching to the converted. So I'll give a little more explanation. I spend a lot of time in Africa, but I need to qualify that. I spend more time than the average American physically in Africa, which in my case usually amounts to one or two weeks a year, working with our teams in East and Southern Africa. But all the rest of the year, I'm in Africa, or could I say Africa is on my mind every single day, not just that I'm in the news, I'm communicating with our teams on the ground, I'm on social media with Africans. And I have uh, come to bring this message tonight because something is weighing on my heart. In fact, this is an adaptation I think I indicated just a moment ago. This is a presentation that I developed for Africa. I have found, quite shockingly, in countries that are, in some cases, 80% Christian, supposedly, professing Christians in denial that there are spiritual predators in the church. They will defend false teachers who have been caught dead to rights, teaching outrageous heresy and committing acts that should land them in prison for a long time. and attacking people like us who are attempting to warn the church. And what I hear from them, one could say, is something along these lines. What's your problem? What is the big deal? Live and let live. Well, these are Africans talking. Who appointed you judge over everyone? You're just heresy hunters. You just hate everybody. Is this what you call Christian love? Just preach the truth and let God handle the rest. Fault finders. I submit to you that the real problem, if we could sum it up, is more along these lines. Christ and the New Testament authors give believers many warnings, instructions, and commands about Deceivers who target the people of God. And three specific kinds of deceiver stand out in the New Testament text, at least I think so. False Christs, Jesus himself warned us about those. False prophets and false apostles. All of them claiming to have divine, special divine knowledge, power, and authority people to be reckoned with, people one does not easily ignore when they show up. And I submit to you that their inspiration, according to the New Testament, is both carnal and demonic. So, any African friends who are watching tonight, was this only a first century phenomenon that I'm talking about here tonight that I'm going to document in just a few moments? Or is it a today thing? And in fact, are such people among us now? What does the Bible tell us? Let the scripture speak. Here's how the Bible characterizes what I call unrepentant deceivers. A very specific category of person. Not somebody who's you know, off in a shed someplace believing falsehoods and not bothering anyone. Unrepentant deceivers, false Christs, Matthew 24, false prophets, Mark 13, false teachers, 2 Peter 2, super apostles, 2 Corinthians 11, savage, ravenous wolves, Matthew 7, Acts 20, ungodly persons, Jude 4, evil people, imposters, 2 Timothy, deceitful workers, 2 Corinthians 11, Hypocritical liars with seared consciences, 
1 Timothy 4. Men of depraved mind, 2 Timothy 3. Worthless in regard to the faith, 2 Timothy 3. Stains and blemishes, 2 Peter 2. Rebellious, Titus 1. Empty talkers, Titus 1. Untaught, writes Peter in his second letter. Unstable, unscrupulous, he writes in the same letter. Ungodly, Jude 4. Grumblers, finding fault, Jude 16. And they are greedy. Almost in every instance, we have reason to believe that they are greedy, 2 Peter 2. The New Testament authors write about those who are following after their own lusts. Again, this isn't just describing wayward saints of some description or just nominal believers. These are people who are professing to have some kind of divine authority for their assault on the faith. They're following after their own lusts. Really? Well, here's the thing that makes us different from the New Testament authors and people like Peter and Paul and John. I believe that they had special discernment, I'm serious, into the motives of the false teachers. We cannot always, with absolute confidence, encounter someone who is teaching untrue doctrine and know their motives. But I believe, from the evidence of Scripture, that the New Testament authors knew what the motives of these people of whom they spoke and wrote, what their motives were. And so I will not arrogate such an ability to myself, but I take it very seriously when they say that people are not only following after their own lusts, they are slaves of their own appetites, Romans 16. They're of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. And suppose that godliness is a means of gain, 1 Timothy 6. In fact, in the worst cases, they have eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin and hearts trained in greed, 2 Peter 2. Now, some are outwardly humble. We might think of a false prophet or two uh, who might be regarded as such by certain people, while others are openly boastful and self-exalting, 2 Corinthians 11. They speak arrogantly, Jude 16. They reject authority, Jude 8, 2 Peter 2. They're self-centered and reckless. And in fact, 1 Timothy 6, the one who advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words and with a doctrine conforming to godliness is conceited. And by the way, you know it all, heretics, according to Paul, you understand, really understand, nothing. Speaking of their methods and motives, they oppose the truth, which might be self-evident at this point. They use trickery and craftiness and deceitful scheming, Ephesians 4. How often have you heard it said of some false teacher, well, they don't really mean any harm. But in fact, in all too many cases, they do. They are the intentionality of their error and their tactics in carrying it out is somewhat breathtaking. They disguise themselves as sheep, Matthew 7, apostles of Christ, 2 Corinthians 11, servants of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 11. They deceive with False words, 2 Peter 2. Empty words, Ephesians 5. Empty deception in accordance with human tradition and the elementary principles of the world, Colossians 2. They use persuasive arguments, Colossians 2. Smooth and flattering speech, Romans 16. And indeed, they use flattery for the sake of gaining an advantage. It's really all about them in the end. They cause dissensions. They're divisive, Romans 16. They entice unstable souls. They know how to size you up, 2 Peter 2. They employ stealth. For example, in Jude 4, they have crept in unnoticed, 2 Peter 2. They secretly introduce destructive heresies, 2 Timothy 3. Some of them slip into households and they captivate their victims. 
They are like hidden reefs in your love feasts, Jude 12. They're false brothers, in fact, who, Paul writing now about events in the book of Acts, sneaked in to spy on our freedom in order to enslave us. They exploit others. 2 Corinthians 11. I like the King James expression. They make merchandise of you. They disrupt whole households for the sake of dishonest gain. They devour 2 Corinthians 11. They defraud Colossians 2. They lie, 1 Timothy 4. They produce counterfeit writings. Really? <laughs> 2 Thessalonians 2. They distort the gospel of Christ, Galatians 1. They're physically abusive, 2 Corinthians 11. They deny the master who bought them. And indeed, deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ, Jude 4. These persons, their methods and motives are varied, but, th but there's, there's a theme here. They take their stand on the basis of visions. Imagine that. They delight in the worship of angels, Colossians 2. They're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3. They disparage all the things that they do not understand, Jude 10. They use abusive speech where they have no knowledge, 2 Peter 2. They don't understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Again, is this reminding you of anything of anyone. Although they profess to know God, by their actions they deny him and are in fact detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. So, they promote another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, a different spirit, 2 Corinthians 11, a different gospel. They promote demonically inspired teachings. 1 Timothy 4, 1 John 1, false knowledge. They promote useless speculation. 1 Timothy 1, fruitless discussion. 1 Timothy 1, worthless stories. Maybe you've heard some. 1 Timothy 4, perverse and distorted things. Acts 20, indecent behavior. Jude 4, and not surprisingly, myths. Now, I cannot explore all the dimensions and dynamics of this problem, this threat here tonight. And the names and faces change over time. The tricks and tactics vary from one individual to another. But again, what I've just been sharing with you to this point is what we, as God's people are up against. Not people who are just casually confused or ignorantly opinionated. Unrepentant spiritual predators. The people I'm talking about and the scripture is warning us against are on a mission from hell. And I do not believe I overstate the matter. Now, of course, not all false teachers exhibit all of these characteristics, even after 40 years. I would find it very difficult to find a false teacher who hits every single one of these marks perfectly. But any combination of the foregoing is deadly stuff. The list demonstrates at least two key truths. First of all, the problem isn't just real, it's severe. And that Number two, every believer is a target. Because, and I'll say it again, the deceivers are in most cases predatory and acting intentionally. Actively seeking to exploit the ignorance, the naivete, the moral weakness, and other vulnerabilities of their prey in order to gratify their own desires. As Paul wrote to Timothy in his second letter, evil people and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Spiritual counterfeiters, these people of whom I've been talking these few minutes, 
Tactically, they mount assaults on the church that are, in some cases, frontal, in some cases, subtle. But make no mistake, they attack Christ himself, almost invariably, if not directly by implication. They undermine the unity of his church, and in effect, they bar the door to heaven for their victims. They often operate individually, as singular personalities. Maybe they'll have a podcast or a series of books or a radio program or some such thing. They might be super duper influencers. But very often they operate and promote their errors institutionally through superficially Christian churches, societies, fellowships, and so on. So I propose to you that the threat they pose to believers calls for both individual and institutional responses. And again, I would say that in considering what we should do in response to such people, I'd say that paranoia is not best, even though someone reading all those scriptures could be justified in having a rather wide-ranging fear of anyone who comes with a variation on something that the Bible may teach. The best response to these people in this phenomenon is what I call biblical vigilance. And it's a matter of knowing your enemy and knowing yourself. And I propose that scripture tells us what the attitude should be for our attitude toward deceivers, ourselves, and the deceived. So our attitude, our posture toward deceivers. Again, vigilance, watchfulness. Colossians 2, see to it that there is no one who takes you captive. It helps to know that people are looking to do this. Take care that no one keeps defrauding you of your prize, Colossians 2. Keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned and turn away from them, Romans 16. Knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unscrupulous people and lose your own firm commitment, 2 Peter 3. And of course, we must have a willingness to call out unrepentant spiritual counterfeiters and their organizations by name when it is necessary and appropriate to do so. But then again, what should our attitude be toward ourselves? You could say that the church keeps these people in business. Does it not? 2 Timothy 4, For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Who are, who, who's the they in this passage? Non-Christians? No, 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 people, people in the churches, sadly. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Jude 17 and following. You, beloved, remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts, who cause divisions. They're worldly-minded, devoid of the truth. But you, beloved, you and me, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to eternal life. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. And then our attitude toward the deceived. Not the victimizers, not the predators, but their victims. The people who have been deluded by such folks. Cautious compassion. 2 Timothy 2, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but instead be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them 
repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Jude 22 and 23. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. James 5. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who has turned the sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Our responsibility as Christians means that we must clearly understand that the antidote for deception, doctrinal deception, spiritual deception, is biblical discernment. Which is to say, discernment that requires data. It requires data of two kinds. And here we come into the realm of countercult apologetics, if you will. Discernment requires data from God's word and also from a careful study of the spiritual counterfeits themselves. Now, this is not a novel idea. I believe that we find our example for this in the apostles. They are our models. So, for example, in Acts 17, 16 to 34, what is Paul doing on Mars Hill? He is skillfully employing his knowledge of pagan philosophies in evangelizing unbelievers. And in their epistles, Paul and Peter and John, for example, all use their familiarity with the false teachings of Judaizers and early Gnostics to expose them and refute them. You can't effectively warn people about something you don't know about, that you don't understand, that you haven't given careful attention to in order to respond appropriately. So I believe that the apostles did a kind of apologetics research. They had to carefully gather information to correctly understand and analyze false teachings and the arguments behind them so they could answer the errors, as I've just said, warn the body of Christ, and call those who are spreading dangerous deception. It's too late to get Joseph Smith, but not too late to get his missionaries. To call them to repentance and true faith. So we must disciple believers, my brothers and sisters, for discernment, as I close, in four important ways. First, to identify dangerous cultic groups and teachers and teachings. To mark them out, as scripture says. Second, understand them. Don't just condemn them, understand them. How their claims and practices depart from biblical Christianity. Third, we must answer their claims and their practices from scripture and other evidences. And then we must evangelize their followers sensitively and strategically. Now again, I've been sort of preaching to the converted because I think that a shining example of such work was our late brother, Dale Ratzleff. Again, as someone who's been in this field a very long time, I find few people who have so embodied the kind of response to error that we see explained in scripture. He faithfully modeled serious scholarship in short supply in almost every age. Accuracy, clarity, accessibility, fairness. That was Dale. He modeled a humble and gracious tone toward his opponents who were numerous. He spoke the truth in love. And he had a consistent focus on Christ and the good news. Brothers and sisters, may we go forth and do likewise. Thank you. <laughs>